Hello, everybody. Welcome to Profiling Evil by Mike King. I'm here with Chris McDonough, and today we have a special treat for you as we prepare for this uh, Veterans Day. We, we're going to listen to and, and learn from a great American hero, John Stryker Meyer. Well, great. Let's let's bring him in, and would you please introduce him to the, the crowd, and we'll say hello. Tilt, how you doing? Doing good in Tennessee. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Hi, Tilt. John Strykermeyer, who goes by Tilt, an American hero. Uh, from 1968 to 1970, he was a 1-0, which is a team leader for the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observations Group. He was on Recon Team Idaho. Uh, he was involved in some of the most dangerous operations of the Vietnam War deep behind the enemy lines. He led clandestine border operations in Laos, Cambodia, and North America or North uh, Vietnam, excuse me. The missions included, yeah, exactly. Probably North America too, Tilt, knowing you. Uh, the, mi the missions included sabotage, calling in B-52 bomber strikes, search and rescues <clears throat> of downed US pilots in the jungle, and quite frankly, uh, attempts at snatching enemy POWs and enemy soldiers. Tilt is the author of many books. You'll see him over here on my should be behind my shoulder here, including uh, on the ground, the secret war in Vietnam, across the fence, and many of his own memoirs in the Sog Chronicles uh, and volumes uh, one and, and multiple others on his website, SogChronicles.com. If you have not had an opportunity to meet this great American, you're going to. Uh, Tilt, thank you so much. We're great. We're we're. We're just so proud to call you a friend. And Mike and I are just honored to have you here uh, tonight to talk about uh, some of your experiences and represent uh, some of your team members uh, from the past. Well, thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, I'm a survivor, not a hero. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, yeah, let's keep this we had, I was very fortunate um, to, to survive it all. And here we are today. So thank you for uh, for the invite. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Well, and I suspect, Tilt, that uh, you, you really do think about that and really value that special position, which gives you such a responsibility to remember those who couldn't come home. Indeed. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, over the years, it's one of the goals has been to try to, at first, the first 20 years, we couldn't talk about it. We signed a, a, a contract with the government saying, it's a secret war you won't talk about. So we don't. So after a while, you get used to not talking about it and keeping a low profile. And none of us went into the Special Forces or the Green Berets to get medals. We went in to serve our country. And in the 60s, that was, and it still is the top military unit in our country, of which we're very proud. And uh, um, I applied, lucked out. They must have lowered the standards or something. I got in. <laughs> and uh, so basically, uh, I flunked out of college. Uh, the draft was on 1966, so I enlisted, went through basic at Fort Dix, advanced infantry training down at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Then from there, we were tested for special forces. I passed all the tests, written, psychological, showing we could swim. And then we went to jump school three weeks at Fort Benning. And then from there, went right to special forces training in uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, because by 67, when we were going through that training, the war was really kicking up. The casualty rate for special forces was uh, was high, and we didn't know about the secret war, but the secret war, which ultimately had the highest casualty rate of all, was really picking up speed, and the casualties were increasing. Interesting. So let's tell – this is kind of a free-for-all. Mike and I kind of go back and forth in any direction you want to take this, you know, conversation. Feel free just to, you know – let us let us have it and and let's go with it. So the, the I have a, I have a quick question though. The, the first sure. one I want to kick off kick off here is how'd you get your nickname? We grew up on pinball machines in Trenton, New Jersey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Boom. Like, you guys lose. You lose the game. You walk away pissed <laughs> off. I lose. I shake the shit out of the machine. I get okay. The <laughs> family <laughs> show. Family <laughs> show too. You got that as a kid. You went in the army. Give us some background on the Vietnam War at that time and what was really going on in, in Laos and how you got into the military. What pulled you into it? Well, um, like I said, I flunked out of college. They had to draft then. So I knew I was going to get drafted. 
I read the book, The Green Berets, and uh, said, well, if I'm going to Nam, I want to go with these guys if I qualify. So I went through all the tests and got in. And they had a new program at that time where young people that came in the Army, like myself, and a lot of other buddies um, all came in. They, uh, they called it the Young or the Baby SF, Baby Special Forces Program. So we came in, went right through all this basic, and then right straight to brag for Green Beret training. And then you went through, back then it was three phases. Phase one, you go through training, general training about everything from land navigation to teamwork, um, survival, little hand-to-hand -hand for good luck, learn how to eat, <laughs> cook snakes. They used to call us snake eaters, you know, because of that training. And Interesting. then you learned your military job. In my case, it was comma, which included Morse code. And then phase three, you practice together in the traditional A team, which is a Green Beret A team of 12 men, an officer, an executive officer. And then you had um, different five different jobs, intel, comma, medic, weapons, and demolitions. And then you would, as an A team, you would train each other. Now that's the conventional Green Berets. So when I get in country in Vietnam, myself, Johnny McIntyre, a bunch of our buddies, we go through the in-country training. At the end, as we have been foretold, uh, somebody's going to ask you to volunteer for projects. And when that happened, the guy comes out and goes, hey, we got these projects. Anybody want to volunteer? And McIntyre asked him who or what? Sergeant Mary goes, you're either you're in or you're out. So you no, know, in 1968, the, you know the movie The Green Berets was out with John yeah. Wayne. So, John Wayne, yeah. right? And Peterson, Peterson, remember Peterson? Indeed, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I figured if the I knew what the Duke would say, so we did it. We just signed up, and a couple of days later, we were in Da Nang, got the top secret briefing, and like the funny thing was, after months of training, over a year of training, um, we go in there, we all get our pads and pencils, and the first thing the sergeant major goes. Put that shit away. And they brought up a piece of paper, which was the document to sign for the 20-year war. And then they gave us an option. Anybody doesn't want it, you can leave now or sign. Then they gave us the briefing a couple of days later. Um, me and Johnny McIntyre and John Hutchins, we flew into uh, FOB-1, Fubai, which is an i Corps northern part of South Vietnam. We got off the South Vietnamese Air Force helicopter, which in and of itself was quite an experience. Yeah, tell us about that. Team. ST Idaho got on it and disappeared. And the two American yeah. Green Berets and the four indigenous troops from that team remain missing in action today. So uh, with Veterans Day, you know, that's one of the things that always weighs heavily on our heart this time of the year. And every day we always think about Glenn Lane, who was the team leader, and uh, Robert Owen was the assistant team leader. So that was my wow. introduction to the secret war. And uh, within a few days, we'd heard about other recon teams. Now, I landed there in May. So earlier, we had several other teams that have been wiped out, a couple teams that had one American that survived. And uh, we knew that uh, communism was not fooling around. There was, there was a very serious and deadly war across the fence. Interesting. Mike, what are your thoughts? Uh, to uh, this guy? No, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking... So, John, um, what was it like for a young man to to land? You all of a sudden uh, are uh, no longer living the commercial dream. You're actually there in in the dirt and the mud, <laughs> and you're all alone. What were some of those nights like for you as you thought about home and about the mission that you had? And how did you separate them so that you could focus on the mission without letting home get in the way of your judgment? Um, over time, we trained for, you know, compartmentalization of whatever's going on. So like we had the monsoons, you got to fill sandbags. Okay, it's not a big deal. But after the team got wiped out, I had to rebuild the team. We did a lot of training because the one thing was that with your training, once you got on a mission, if something occurred, you hope you have been trained on it enough that your responses would be, your muscles would be trained like weapons, everything else. And uh, um, when you had that moment to think about things at night in the jungle where you moved your hand in front of your face, you couldn't see it. You could feel it, but you couldn't see it. Um, you were just 
thinking about in my case is like we went through our training and now I'm here. This is like the OSS in World War II flying in behind enemy lines and working with indigenous people there. And our case, we flew behind enemy lines, but our recon team was there just to snoop and poop to see what we could find out and go through some of the missions that uh, Chris talked about earlier. And uh, we kept it pretty well separated. You know, he came back to the base, there'd be letters from the family and grandma striker. She wrote faithfully every week and you appreciated that. And um, in retrospect, one of the things I appreciate was that everybody was praying because they had to be praying pretty hard because I, I was the greenest green beret ever walked into Vietnam. And I was really fortunate because there's a lot of experienced SF men who didn't come home and uh, always felt very fortunate. And I had good Vietnamese and we were very fortunate with air assets that when we called, they came and uh, they, they worked around us and helped to get us out. Interesting. So in 68, John, I mean, that's pretty much when a lot of things were really at its peak almost. I mean, and in, in, oh, absolutely in, at that time, right? It was. Yep. It was the uh, the war effort, the manpower buildup. At one point near the end of 68, the American commitment was 542,000 Americans in Vietnam. Now, out of the 542,000, 10% were actually engaged in combat. The rest were engaged in support, uh, guard duty, uh, admin. There's just a lot of other important functions that make an army or the Marine Corps work. Now, out of that, we had 20,000 Green Berets that, that went to Vietnam. Out of that, mm -hmm. 2,000 were in SOG, our operation. Out of that, depending on which author you talk to, there'd be between four to 700 Green Berets that actually ran missions across the fence with a recon team or a hatchet force. So let's break that down for a moment for our audience, because maybe a lot of the audience doesn't, an FOB is a forward operation base. Correct. And you were, yes, you were that time. yeah, so, and you are a one zero. So can you tell everybody what exactly a one zero, what your well, responsibility is? Well, recon team for SOG, you had a, a, a one zero as the team leader, and that's the man with the most experience. The one one would be assistant team leader, then one, two would be the radio operator. And then you have indigenous troops. Now for Idaho, we were very fortunate. We had South Vietnamese and uh, three or four of them had, their families had come South in 54. And they were just outstanding fighters and um, fearless in the field. And our, my counterpart was Nguyen Van Sao. Again, you know, I was on a team for five months where we did a lot of training. We did, um, we inserted sensors, uh, Air Force sensors in the Ashaw Valley, and went up by Quezon after they had closed Quezon. But the main highway that went by, the Air Force still wanted to know what was coming down the trail. So we had these uh, three-part sensors that we installed. Had a big center pod and then had coaxial cables that went out to two more sensors. We had to bury everything. And then the Air Force could pick up the transmissions off of those to see what was coming down the trail. And then we had a couple of in-country practice missions. And then on uh, October the 6th, we ran uh, a target that was uh, Echo 4. And it was a, just a, a, a general recon to find out. And we had a rumor that there was an American POW camp. And we were hoping to try to get some intel on that, try to locate it if we could. And, uh, by the night of the first day, we had trackers. They were close to us. The next day, we left at first light. We moved, and we saw a couple enemy soldiers, and we got to the top of a little knoll, and around about 2 o'clock, they hit us. And they hit us wave after wave. And fortunately, the knoll was, wasn't too big, so they could only come up with so many people, and we would blow them back in the jungle. And over time, we killed so many that they stacked up the bodies of their dead soldiers so they could climb up and try to get an angle to shoot down at us. So they were using them as turrets almost. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah they were, at least the sandbags, yeah. Like I mean, sandbags, yeah. Really yeah. Sandbags. It's, it, and think about the soldier on the other side watching their buddies get killed, and they would come after us with that kind of tenacity 
it was a wake up call, but that was again, the direct exposure to uh, the, the effort that the North Vietnamese army and the communists were willing to go through to get us. Wow. Now, how far north in Laos were you assigned, John? And, and were you there at the time of the heavy bombing as well? Well, November of 68 was when President Johnson, um, frustrated, he halted bombing in North Vietnam, which had a severe impact on us because uh, as soon as that, as soon as the uh, communists learned that, the anti-aircraft weaponry, a lot of the personnel that were up north then came south down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and they brought their heavy weapons with them. And um, throughout 69 and 70, it was much more intense. They had more personnel. And you know, our government had this agreement where we would have no combat troops in Laos or Cambodia. Don't ask me why. It's our government. And the Congress had agreed to it on paper, I think, but they never abided to it. And uh, so by 68, they had 25, 35,000 in Laos. And in Cambodia, by Thanksgiving, they had over 100,000 that were in Cambodia. They would come across the border, attack our base, our allies, and then go back. And traditional troops could not go in to do combat with them. So we had to go in to try to get intel to see what the hell was going on. And that was basically Indeed. the long and the short of what our mission was. And these were NVA regulars, these guys. Yes, they were hardened regulars. And again, just like today, I mean, well, today's media is much more biased and prejudiced than it was 50 years ago. But it was biased then, too. And um, they kept reporting how the little farmer in the field would plow his field by day and fight those nasty, aggressive Americans at night as Viet Cong. Well, it was just bullshit. Yeah, there were good Viet Cong. There were some outstanding Viet Cong units because they fought the French and they right. fought the Japanese in World War II. They were outstanding soldiers. But by the time 68 got around, the North Vietnamese, the communist cadre controlled all those actions. And they worked with the, with the Viet Cong and they supplied it. And without the NVA coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, bringing supplies in from Cambodia, that war would have ended much more quickly. But it did because all those caveats were in place. So our job was to try to wave the flag, let people know. Interesting. So what do you got, Mike? So, yeah, I, I, di I didn't know if this would help, uh, John, as you're talking, just bringing in the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, southern Vietnam and then uh, up into Laos. As, as you're talking, I, I hope that might be a little helpful for people to kind of visualize things. It does. It's, it's, it's an accurate depiction. And uh, as the war went on, the longer the war went on, the more the NVA worked to build more trails. And um, the supplies that came down, they were from the communist bloc countries everywhere, China, Russia, Czechoslovakia. You name one of those commie countries that were in the Eastern Bloc, they would be supporting North Vietnam. And did they have that support? Did, North Vietnam couldn't have sustained it, and we couldn't even. They, the Navy couldn't even go into Hai Phong Harbor to blow up enemy ships. Interesting. <laughs> did they have? Did they have uh, communist advisors uh, attached to their units? Uh, oh too? yes, absolutely. They had when the NVA came down. They would have a top military man, but they would also have the communist cadre, whatever their title is, uh -huh. and the cadre would be the top guy. And he's the one that would dictate terms and conditions. And the military guy had to go along with what the cadre wanted. And um, that's the way they operate. And that's the way they've done it for years before. And uh, even, even during World War II, like they're fighting the French resistance. The OSS, people like Jack Singlob and other folks that jumped in behind enemy lines that worked with the French resistance, there was, a, there was a similar operation with the communists. The Russians were there, and they were working with the French resistance. But they would do their operations where they could get more headlines or get more publicity or get PR. And the cadre ruled what the communists did with the French resistance. So that kind of thing went on for a long time, whereas our OSS men 
they went in and they worked with the local indigenous troops to do anything they could to, uh, to defeat the Nazis. Interesting. Mike, <laughs> thank you. Well, no, I mean, I mean, this is so fascinating. And, and John, I, I'm, I'm really a geography guy. I remember my uh, cousin coming home and he served in Northern Laos as well. It was during deer season. So about this time of year in, in Utah. And I was so excited to see him because he had been uh, injured in, in combat and I was looking all over the mountain for him. They told me he was up a draw. And uh, finally, I heard him kind of whispering. And I looked up in a tree, and he had pulled himself up in a tree. He was in a full body cast from the hips down. And uh, he pulled himself up in this tree and tied himself off so that he could hunt deer. And uh, <laughs> I, I was always just so proud of Jimmy. And, and uh, I just love, I, I loved hearing the locations. When you were in uh, Laos, were you in those most northern provinces where the heavy bombing started later on? No. Uh, we had the heaviest bombing in Laos was along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And that yeah, was in fact, I, I brought that in. I thought you might be interested in seeing that. We, we actually had... Uh, I had the data on every bomb that was dropped in that conflict. And so maybe this will help too, as we talk. Get out. You had every bomb? It, every, every bomb from every plane, uh, including those that obviously didn't explode. But uh, yeah, so the, the dark red are the locations where the heaviest bombing was and blue extends all the way up, uh, obviously everywhere that you were. Uh, but yeah, isn't that, something to to look at the the uh, magnitude of that oh yeah yeah and uh that was one of the things that we tried to do to uh to block the supplies to block the manpower moving south at least to impede it and to do what we could to uh, to hassle the enemy when they're coming south and uh you know there are days when our little recon team we we were in contact for two or three hours and wow. we just alone would go through, you know, I'm, not, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't count, but there are a lot of bombs, uh, mini <laughs> bombs, <laughs> rockets. That I just wouldn't count those. Rockets. <laughs> yeah. But we went through Buku. <laughs> Buku, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, so you guys were on some of the most clandestine missions, obviously, of the war. And uh, the government denied your existence, right? Right. There's a there's a tape of uh, President Nixon in September of 69 at a press conference saying we have no troops stationed in Laos. That's true. We weren't stationed. We were stationed in <laughs> Vietnam. We flew in by helicopter. Unreal. And uh, he goes, there's some other activities, but we're not going to talk about that today. And that was us. Of course, uh, you're referring also to the CIA operation, which was a separate operation where they worked with the um, the Mungs up north, further north, and further west of our area of operations. Because our area of operations from Vietnam into Laos went approximately 40 meters, I mean, 40 kilometers. And then we were limited because the U.S. ambassador was involved and uh, we had to run most of the missions that we ran past him. So, and, and, they, and they call that an AOR, right? An AOR, area, area of, of operation. Yeah, area of operation. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. No, it, it, the, the missions would come for directly from the White House to our headquarters, and then any of our reports would go to our headquarters and directly to the White House. They had a liaison at the White House whose job was to um, specifically look at our reports and to send the miss missions over and they always wanted more intel about what was coming, future actions, and particularly after the Tet of 68, because 68 was the peak year for American activity. It was the year of the Tet Offensive. And again, the media uh, during the time, including good old Uncle Walt, um, <laughs> who uh, said that, you know, at the end of the Tet Offensive, tried to suggest that we had lost, lost the war when, in fact, every major battle – there we had won, and uh, when uh, President Johnson saw that Cronkite even came out against it, ignoring yeah. the facts, 
as many journalists do today, sadly, um, he said, if, we, if we've lost Walt, we've lost the war. And that was the yeah. PR war. And uh, like with any war, it's difficult getting accurate stories out there. But uh, and, the, and the North Vietnamese, the communists were by 68, you know, after after 50 years of misinformation fighting and in Europe and with the America, they they sent communists over to get into our government after world, right after World War One. As yeah. soon as there was the USSR, which was formed in 1917, that stuff's been going on. And it's much more sophisticated today. It hasn't stopped. Jeez. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with that 100%. Go ahead, Mike. You know, I, I read about one experience where you were involved in, you and your team were being extracted, and uh, somehow somebody forgot to strap themselves in to tightly. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of my favorite stories, only because it's it's uh, it's more embarrassing. But I was just another, another lucky of a young kid, just lucky to have a good helicopter pilot that set me down. But and the reason why, you know, again, we had prior to that mission, on that mission, we had decided to come in with a two thousand pound bomb, drop it in the middle of the jungle where there were no people around hoping to get the, just to be able to get on the ground to go see what was going on. Because three or four days prior to that, every day in the morning, we get in the helicopters, go out to the AO. We would get shot out of the primary, secondary, and the alternate LZs, turn around, come back, eat lunch. They would refuel. And if they didn't, if they didn't have enough bullet holes to curtail the flight, we'd fly back and do it again to another target. And again, we got shot out. So S3, the operation said, let's try something different. They dropped a 2,000-pound bomb. And the first time they did it was in the middle of this jungle because I was right behind the helicopter. The plane came in, dropped it, it exploded. And the plan was as soon as the dust cleared, we would repel into the target. Well, the first time they did it, there were secondary explosions because the, the helicopter, the King Bee, the South Vietnamese helicopter, was taking me down. I'm getting ready to repel into the target. And these, all these explosions start going on. So we pulled out. And to this day, Ho Chi Minh is trying to figure out how these Americans found out about this cache. This is dumb <laughs> blind luck. So the next time I did it again, this time I repelled in. Halfway down the rope, I hear enemy soldiers talking back and forth or indigenous people talking back and forth. So I'm on the ground for a few minutes. There's a couple of NBA came down. We shot at each other. I don't know if I hit them or not. And so obviously we're compromised and I had to get lifted out. The helicopter had left. He finally came back. And in those days we had a Swiss seat, a rope seat around our waist and around our legs, had a D ring hooked into it. And you're supposed to get the rope and hook into a D ring on your chest. So if you get shot, you would be, at least your body would be there and you could get it back. Well, as I'm getting pulled out, I'm getting shot at. So I'm shooting at the NVA. And then the helicopter pilot heard the rounds fired. And instead of going straight up and taking me up above the jungle and then going home, he decided to take off and uh, tilt was like the living pinball for a couple of minutes. They're <laughs> staying off the trees. <laughs> And uh, during that time when I came out, my arms, the crooks of my arms got bloodied because of getting battered with the rope and everything else. We got high up. I, I was changing arms, and then we hit an air pocket, and I got flipped upside down. And so all my web gear and my harness and my backpack all came down on my throat. So I'm upside down, and then the Swiss seat went down on my knees, and I had my legs spread. And it was just like a New York, New York City hooker. It's just a cheap little hooker. <laughs> and I'm signaling to Henry King, hey, get the helicopter down. <laughs> and uh, so at some point, now I'm, I'm literally choking. And um, I could feel I'm going to faint any any second. Mm -hmm. And my, the rope went down on my feet. I had my feet spread. And right before I passed out, I saw my – I had the life before your eyes thing. I saw the headline wow. in the local newspaper. I had a couple other incidents, like car accidents I almost had. And uh, 
and then I passed out. But luckily, <clears throat> when I passed out, the king bee pilot had lowered it. So I only fell maybe 10 to 15 feet. And I landed in the elephant grass, which is 10 to 15 feet tall. And it cushioned the fall. But I was unconscious. Henry King came out, took off all my gear, threw me in the helicopter. And I remember my head bouncing off the floor going, ah, oh, I feel so good. I'm still alive. <laughs> oh, man. Unreal. My, gear there, my gun, my car 15, my sod knife. They're still in Laos. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's uh let's talk about your team tell us about your team oh yeah your, your well the team, i'm alive today thanks to the team you know when it got uh, when we rebuilt it uh robert uh robert parks aka spider was the new team leader he had been on a team for four or five missions and he just got promoted to an, to be a team leader for another team so he didn't go on that faithful mission in May. <clears throat> so when Idaho got wiped out, Bob knew the people. He knew the indigenous troops, and um, they respected him. So he became the team leader. Don Walken became the assistant team leader. I was the radio operator. And as the radio operator, besides Autocamo, whenever you have an airstrike, the radio operator is the one that directs all of the airstrikes, at least on our team. That was my job. Spire and I worked on it. He trained me up on do's and don'ts. And uh, with Spider as the one zero, we ran three missions. And uh, two of those were the installation of those um, um, sensors, the Air Force sensors. And then we had a uh, mission where two teams went in east of the Ashaw Valley. And Ashaw Valley was our worst target area. And um, the other team ambushed an, an enemy ambush. And we were just there, had a quiet mission, came back. And then we had that mission on October 5th, and I mean, October 6th and 7th, where we were engaged with the enemy for four over four hours. And we came out, I came out with the last magazine, because we carried over 600 rounds, last magazine and the last hand grenade. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we had happened twice, at least twice where during the firefight, when we finally got extracted, it was down to the last magazine. And, and, and in this mission, there's such dramatic contrast. Like we've been engaged in this deadly firefight and a helicopter pilot, Captain Tin from the South Vietnamese Air Force, he hovered for 10 minutes waiting for us to get there. We threw all the guys on. And, you know, the gunships are making gun runs. The enemy are coming at us. We're blowing them back in the jungle. And we finally lift off. And it's right at, at last light. And so you go from all this apocalyptic death roar noise. And then all of a sudden you see the jungle, this bright or dark green emerald jungle with all these pretty little sparks where they're AK-47s trying to shoot us down. But wow. it looked beautiful from the helicopter as we left. And uh, just one of those little uh, surprising moments. You know, you, I don't know. That helicopter had 48 holes in it from uh, enemy rounds that went through it. And none of our guys were hit. And so we yeah. flew south for a little bit. And we had the sweetest sunset we had ever seen. And uh, just another day in SOG. Well, two days before that, Lynn Black, uh, we had a team, a nine-man team that went in, and they made contact with what turned out to be an NVA division of 10,000. Wow. And they had an all-day conflict. Several helicopters were shot down. Fast movers, A1E Sky Raiders, were damaged, wounded by enemy, or damaged by enemy gunfire. And they got him out at the last moment. And 20 years later, he, uh, the Americans went back because one of the Americans was left behind. And after that effort by the government to go back, Lin got a phone call from the North Vietnamese colonel who ambushed his team that day. And so to, to get to the bottom of the story, they're talking. And Lin goes, you know, you killed three of our people that day. And the colonel goes, well, you inflicted 90% casualties on our team, our men. Well, Lynn goes, yeah, we saw the flag. 
you know, we assumed it was a battalion. He goes, no, it was a division. We had 10,000 men. You inflicted wow. 9% casualties. And then for toppers, the colonel goes, who was the radio operator? Because when <laughs> it got ambushed, the team leader who was inexperienced walked the team into an ambush. And when he got ambushed, everybody went to the ground except Lynn. He stood there because he just was shooting. They walked into an L-shaped ambush. And at some point, uh, the colonel goes to him. He's a general when he's talking to him. He goes, who was the radio operator? Lynn goes, that was me. He goes, well, you shot me three times. <laughs> <laughs> and he was the guy that confirmed that the um, that it was an NVA division. So we had it straight from the enemy as to what they had engaged that day. And they inflicted, and again, it was the recon team with the Air Force, Marine Corps, uh, gunships, and the Army, the uh, the 176, the gunships were there. They had different turns making the runs. And we had a South Vietnamese helicopter got shot down, a Jolly Green Giant got shot down. And they had they they had casualties there, and of course, three men from the team. Just kind of walk us through what the transition back to to life was like. Well, in my case, um, I refused to think about it. I knew that the, the D Rose is the date when you return to the States. So my D Rose was uh, April 28th or 29th, 1969. And if you look over Chris's shoulder, the book uh, on the ground, that photograph for that book uh, was taken about 10 to 12 days before I came home. And um, we're getting inspected by a general because we had a, mi a mission that was going to go up to north, northern Laos above our area of operations. So that's me. The general was inspecting our team. We gave him a briefing because the mission was um, it had a high element of risk to it. But we planned it. We worked on it. And um, well, I didn't think about it. I refused to think about it. Just focused on the team. And um, that picture was from the inspection. The next day, we launched for the target. And as we got, we were in the air maybe 15, 20 minutes, and they turned us around and came back. They canceled the mission because the target had had uh, a, another aircraft that had been shot down at our target. So um, they figured if the aircraft got shot down, helicopters would be very susceptible to enemy fire. So they canceled that mission. Then we came back, and then we had local guard duty up on the mountaintop. And we went up to the guard duty for a couple of days up there. So I didn't really focus on. We focused on the mission. And uh, the last few days, we had a couple of parties with the guys on the team. And then when it was time to go home, uh, just went came home. We got stationed to Fort Devens. I was there for five months. Hated it. Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Then I got back on my recon team in October of 59. And I had been in base a few days, maybe over a little over a week. And on November 3rd, we had one of our recon teams wiped out. On November 10th, 69, another recon team was completely wiped out. And it was just like returning, like my first tour of duty when we landed. We had these incredible cases where men we knew were gone. And uh, most of those men are still missing in action. Now, a few uh, returned and uh, were buried in Arlington with full honors. And uh, their remains came back back in uh, 2011 and 2012. So it's from one of our recon teams. But to this day, as Chris said earlier, there's still more than 50 uh, missing in action in all of, all of uh, Laos and Cambodia from the Sikhu War. In addition to that, we've now documented over 125 aviators, includes uh, fast movers like the uh, jets, the F-4 Phantoms, A-1 Sky Raiders, helicopters, and, uh, of course, the Jolly Green Giants. And uh, so the Sikhu War was the deadliest of all, had exceeded 100% casualties. And I can see Chris going, how does that happen, him being so good with math and all? Um, <laughs> We had one guy, uh, Bob Howard, who earned the Medal of Honor in December. <laughs> he, uh, he received eight Purple Hearts. He'd been put in for 11. Oh, Several of our guys oh. had multiple Purple Hearts. 
And so you either get wounded, killed in action, or you'd be uh, went missing in action. And that's why the uh, secret war is so deadly. Till you, uh, you have impacted so many lives since then. Talk about why it's so important that we remember veterans on Veterans Day and go beyond just the rote things that we always say and, uh, and maybe what you do to keep in touch with your buddies from combat and maybe equally important, those who didn't make it home, how um, warriors tend to take care of those families or at least continue to keep in touch with them. Well, you know, we started out with a major handicap because the Sikh war has a double – a double-edged uh, liability that attaches. First, you can't talk to anybody in your own family. You can't talk. You can't go home and talk to your mom. Hey, you know, on October sixth, we were surrounded and we killed ten thousand. You can't. You just can't talk about the mission of any kind. And on the other hand, families of people that lost their loved ones, they never knew the truth. So in the in our war, anybody who was killed in action or missing in action, their families would get a letter saying, your son, Joe Bipp, was missing in action in South Vietnam. And we have no further details at this time. And we have so many families where the mothers and fathers have all been passed away and buried. A lot of their siblings now have died without ever knowing the heroics of their family members that they served in the secret war. And uh, we have a special operations association where we meet at a reunion once a year. It was formed by Green Berets from the secret war. And then over time, we added all the aviators because without the aviators, none of us would be here. They, they're the ones that came and pulled our, pulled our lame asses out of the jungle and saved us our team time and time again. And that includes the South Vietnamese Air Force, by the way. I mean, on that day that we talked about upside down, Captain Tuong, I'll never forget him. And uh, he was the pilot to save me there. On Christmas Day, we had a target where we were completely surrounded on a hilltop. And they had the enemy had to fire coming up the hill to get us. And we were getting singed eyebrows and everything from the uh, fire and the smoke. At the last second, the helicopter touched down, blew the flames back. We jumped in and left, and the hill was over, overblown with flames. And uh, so <clears throat> those kind of holidays, we think back. And I used to always call Captain Tuong. Sad that we, uh, we buried him on August the 7th. We had a, a funeral service for him up in um, Little Saigon in Westminster, California. But those those South Vietnamese helicopter pilots were fearless, and um, we had and the Americans were just young kids flying helicopters that were just outstanding, and uh, so we're always grateful for them. And we had this association, and now we have a very active POW MIA committee, it's chaired by Mike Taylor, who was an officer who spent over three and a half years in the war, most of it in the Sikh War either on the ground or flying as a, in the aircraft, re, doing comma with the teams on the ground. And uh, two years ago, Mike went over with DPAA, the Department of POW MIA Accounting Agency. And with the National League of POW MIA Families, they went over on a joint mission where the government officials were talking to the government officials, but the league and Mike went there to talk to enemy soldiers could they lay, the NVA had uh, teams that were designed to track us and to find us and to kill us. And if they killed an American, they got an, I killed an American award. And Mike wow. went there in an effort to improve today's efforts by our government to work in Laos and Cambodia to find our remains. And uh, I don't think they're ever gonna get it done, but we're trying to the end. And in, in response to your question, I mean, Veterans Day to me, Memorial Day, that's what I think about. I'm not into parades and those kind of things. In fact, my wife and I, a lot of times, will just go run and hide away somewhere because um, our war was different and our losses were severe. And I think of the men that we lost 
and I'm alive today thanks to the Vietnamese on my team. So on my team, we had Sal, who was the team leader. By 68, he had been fighting two and a half years, and he was so good in the jungle, he could smell the enemy. That's why every firefight we ever had, if, if the enemy was close, Sal and Hep would trigger it. Hep was our interpreter, a little smart-ass guy, maybe 103 pounds, soaking wet. He spoke four or five languages. He used to correct my English, and uh, <laughs> he was our interpreter, but a critical member of the team. And again, he had been fighting for two or three years. And uh, then we had Fook, who was trained as a point man. And then Do Ti Kwong, who came south with his family. And uh, the team built to have a really strong team so that by 1971, the Americans stopped participating on the team because the indigenous people were so good, they ran missions across the fence by themselves without Green Berets. It's a little thing we're really proud of. Wow. Well, I'll tell you, this has been such an honor to listen to you reminisce a little, um, educate us a lot. Uh, we were fortunate to grow up watching most of this on TV, and uh, and yet uh, w we still remember what the Vietnam War was, and and. Uh, we were, I think Chris and I both were of the age that we were uh, registering for the draft as that came to a close and things were winding down and how grateful sure. uh, I am for, for what you did and everyone who has served since. So thank, well, thank you. you. You know, and here's a key thing. Uh, speaking of our team members, we effectively refer to them as little people, but um, they were on our team fighting communism for a reason. They knew that their government was corrupt, but they preferred a, co a corrupt government that they knew to the communists. You know, and Ken Burns, his great little package on Vietnam, never got around to talking to my little people because they would have squared him away about this communism stuff. And people fail to realize that communism and socialism, um, how they still don't like us, they want to take over the world. And that hasn't ended. And we fought that threat directly and um they had talked to hep and sal they would have told them why we were there and that's why i'm proud of my time served as a green beret with the vietnamese for that purpose did you, you know, until you... we're proud of you for <laughs> well thank you chris go ahead mike go ahead did you tilt yeah, did you have any ahead, uh mike. did you have any um uh, thailand uh, people serving with you? Um, no, um, we didn't. Uh, we launched out of Thailand a couple of times. Sometimes the weather would be so bad in Vietnam and that we couldn't fly over the mountains with bad weather. So we had an airplane that would take us to Thailand and then we launched east into Laos for a target there. And we had all kinds of air assets there and operations that flew out of Thailand but none of the Thais fought in our war with us that I'm aware of. And um, from 1970 on, I know that the Green Berets were in training in northern Thailand, training the Thais and the Thai army to combat Chinese that were already coming across the border there trying to get into Thailand. So, uh, but that was... I wanted to share something with you real quickly. Um, we have uh, very close friends who are uh, monks in our community. One of those said that uh, he, it's the oldest guy here, second to the, to the right, uh -huh. um, who uh, his responsibility was he was assigned to support and take American troops across the border uh, and did so for five years during the war. And he, uh, he, he gets teary eyed when he talks about, the American soldiers, and and he always holds his ears when he talks about uh, the American planes. <laughs> Which way was he gone? From the west to the east or the east to the west? From east to west. <laughs> 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 yeah, and he said it was terribly rugged, and he would uh, he would uh, guide the troops across into that air region. For, and and I don't know enough about that to know how much of that is 
Uh, I, well, I can only assume he's uh, accurate. So, well, yeah, and keep this in mind. Here's another little tidbit from our little dirty war. And at uh, 3.2 million Americans fought in a war, that includes 500,000 sailors that were anchored offshore in Saigon, Cameron Bay. And out of that, you know, I explained we had 20,000 SF. Well, on the last census, either the uh, 2010 or the 2000 census, 12.3 million Americans said they were Vietnam veterans. Wow. Think about those numbers. Yeah. So we have stolen valor aplenty. And the yeah. men who want to fight are now out there stealing the glory. And uh, a friend of mine who has fought to uh, expose phony seals, he stopped doing this five years ago. And when he stopped, they had busted over 25,000 men who were phony seals that would go out and use their pretend seal of valor and they, in such a corrupt way. They would rip off women, charities, and his organization put, like I said, they found out 25,000 phonies over the years. So sorry to hear that. Oh, yeah. On little sidebars and, you know, and light. So tell. So tell. I lost my dad in 2014. Here's his hat. And uh, he had uh, four PUCs. He was a survivor. He's got one, two, three, four, four stars uh, from Vietnam there. Wow. Um, he, this is his bronze star with valor from the chosen reservoir. He was in Fox <laughs> company and the, he's a pro right? one of the frozen chosen, right? Oh right? yeah. So you guys, you guys, you guys are a rare breed. And, and I love you. And I, and I want to, I want the, I want our audience to know as we wrap up here, because my internet's going berserk here, but we're going to, we, we could not have thought of a greater American uh, just so everybody knows who we're talking to, uh, talking to here. This is John Tilt Strykermeyer. His awards and decorations include, and this is just a couple of them. Um, and I know you won't say this yourself, so I'm going to do it as, as a, as a friend of yours. He's, he, he holds the combat infantry badge, the parachute badge, the Army Commendation Ribbon, American Air Medal, National Defense Service Medal, the Vietnam Service Medal, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, PUCs. How many PUCs do you guys have in your, well, in your team? Two. One from the regular SF and then the secret war because it was so secret, we got a presidential unit citation on April the 4th, 2000. Yeah. So that was wow. 50, 25 Great. years after the secret war ended. They <laughs> acknowledged publicly exactly. for the first time. And then we were awarded the uh, presidential unit citation, which is the equivalent of a distinguished service cross for Saad. There you go. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. The Vietnam <laughs> Gallantry Cross Unit Citation, Army Special Forces tabs, and of course, the list goes on. It Till does. you are an American hero. I cannot think of a greater man on this Veterans Day. What causes do you want us to let our audience know and the rest of the world know that are deep in your heart? Because I know uh, you're involved in a lot of a lot of uh, veterans uh, groups as well as the MIA flag behind you. What? How can we help support some of the mission that you're, well, the most you're involved important in thing now? right now? The National League of POW MIA Families. This league of families, because Americans were the first ones in any war to go to the enemy and say, treat our prisoners better. And the league started that in the late 60s. And um, if anybody goes to their website, they can always, they always need donations, particularly during the COVID virus, because their budgets are, and they're a nonprofit. They're not affiliated with the government. And over the last 50 plus years, they've gotten to know every leader, every communist leader in Laos, Cambodia, and North Vietnam, they work with the DIA, the DPAA, and their efforts, continuing efforts to find our remains of our missing in, and to get them repatriated. That's the goal someday. So if anybody wants to, they can go to the National League of POW MIA Families, click on there, 
and uh, support them in any way because they work closely with our our veterans group, the SOA, and uh, they're at the point. They're out there working day and night. The uh, chairman, CEO, she works seven days a week, day and night. She puts in 12-hour days most of the time. She's been through three husbands while working on this effort to find and identify and bring home our Americans. She's just dead. Her name is Ann Mills Griffith. She's one of my heroes. And this lady and her her small staff do a great job. And they can always use the help. Great. So Tell great. Me, thank, we're, we're grateful. Mike, wait, last word. Thanks, and sir. we're nope. going to salute you off here. And uh, Thank you, Connie. We'll, thank you so much for your job. time. Will you come back again? I'll be honored. We come back and the... You got the dime. I got the time. <laughs> we, we, uh, we're constantly uncovering the skeletons, so we'll have to have you back and talk about a few more things. <laughs> yeah, we'll pick up. Sorry about the internet issue. Indeed. <laughs> but I'm sure glad you two talked. John, thank you so much, sir. All right. God we'll, bless we'll, uh, time. Thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Roger that. Thank you. Thank you. Till next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye.